Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 2018 Latin American Business Conference, Latin America from Opportunity to Action. My name is Christian Gonzalez. I am a second year full-time MBA candidate at UCLA Anderson from Chile and co-president of our school's Latin American Business Association, known as LAVA. Today's conference is brought to you by a committee comprised of members of LAVA leadership, members of UCLA's Latino Business Student Association, known as LBSA, the UCLA Anderson Center for Global Management, led by Lucy Allard, and the Los Angeles Area Chamber of Commerce, who have all worked hard to bring this conference to you. On behalf of the committee, I would like to express our delight and pride to have everyone join us here. We do hope that you will enjoy the conference and learn from the influential private and private sector leaders who are gathered here today from various industries and disciplines who invest and conduct business in and with Latin America. Our guest speakers will address the business and investments opportunities in the region and the industries and sectors that are ripe for change, innovation, and positive disruption. They will discuss how Latin America is well positioned to foster stronger and more sustainable economic growth, stimulate innovation and technology advancement, leverage trade opportunities with the United States, and carefully and strategically plan for a brighter future. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Santiago Fernandez. I'm a second year full-time MBA candidate at UCLA Anderson from Mexico. I'm also a vice president of LAVA and the student conference director for this year's Latin American Business Conference. I'm delighted to welcome everyone here today, our distinguished speakers, faculty, students, alumni, sponsors, the Los Angeles business community, and special guests and friends. We're also delighted to welcome a number of council generals and their representatives in Los Angeles here today too. I'd like to extend a special thank you to all our guest speakers, some of whom have traveled long distance to join us today and to our conference sponsors, the UCLA Anderson Center of Global Management, the Los Angeles Chamber of Commerce, City National Bank, Credit Corp, the Port of Los Angeles, and the UCLA Latin American Institute. In particular, I want to recognize Lucia Lard and her team at the Center of Global Management, who have played a crucial role in organizing this conference, and Mr. Carlos Valderrama from the Los Angeles Chamber of Commerce. We're delighted to be hosting this year's conference in partnership with the Chamber again. Thank you so much for continued partnership. I will also like to extend a special thank you to the LAVA and LBSA board members for their dedication and commitment to the conference. To open today's conference, I would like to introduce Sebastian Edwards, distinguished professor and Henry Ford II, Chair in International Management at UCLA Anderson. He also is the School Senior Associate Dean of Global Initiatives and Faculty Director for the Center of Global Management, who provides support and guidance for our conference each year. Professor Edwards will also provide macroeconomic overview of Latin America. From 1993 until 1996, he was the Chief Economist for the Latin America and Caribbean region of the World Bank, and is author of more than 200 scientific articles on international economics, macroeconomics, and economic development. So please join me in welcoming Professor Sebastian Edwards. So let me start with welcoming all of you. Uh, I, uh, we had lunch, the speakers and us had lunch today, and I was telling them that uh, we not only are very um, grateful for them uh, coming here, but we're very grateful that they brought some rain with them. We need rain uh, in Southern California, and uh, that, of course, is uh, uh, something that uh, uh, makes us uh, very happy. Um, this year's um, conference is very, uh, very special in many ways. If you look at the program, what you're going to see is that there are a number of founders of companies that are going to be addressing us. And, uh, that's always a very, very good uh, sign uh, because that means innovation, entrepreneurship, uh, dynamism, uh, a lot of dedication, and uh, uh, it's something I'm looking forward to. We also see that there are companies um, or executives uh, that not only have been, some of them or quite a few of them, um, 
trained here and got their degrees here at UCLA, but also in a variety of uh, areas, um, uh, some of them incredibly innovative. And uh, for instance, we will uh, hear about the most recent uh, innovations in uh, finance um, and how um, people from Latin America or related to Latin America or looking at Latin America are uh, trying uh, to uh, put in place uh, new forms of uh, developing the financial uh, markets. Um, we are going to have a fantastic panel on uh, renewable uh, energy. Um, we have in the region, of course, uh, some of the countries that have the most, uh, the greatest comparative advantage for renewables. And at the same time, we have in our region some of the countries uh, that uh, have traditionally been uh, very, very strong in um, more traditional uh, sources uh, of energy. Uh, we have energy reform going on in Mexico. Uh, we have uh, very interesting developments uh, going on in Chile, in Brazil. Uh, we have Venezuela. We don't know what's going to happen, but whenever it happens, then we're going to have PDVSA and Venezuela going back to its old splendor, and that, of course, is very, very exciting. So let me, uh, again, um, on uh, behalf of uh, uh, the school, on behalf of the faculty, um, thank the uh, different uh, speakers for coming uh, to, UC uh, to UCLA and to, uh, to Anderson and to the conference. Uh, let me congratulate the students who have uh, worked very, very hard uh, to put together uh, this, uh, this program. And uh, let me thank all of you uh, for participating. Uh, let me make two uh, final points uh, uh, before switching gears and moving to uh, the macroeconomic uh, um, overview or, or, or general overview, economic overview of the region. Uh, let me thank uh, Lucy Allard, uh, who is the executive director of the Center for Global Management and the force behind uh, everything that the center does. Uh, the role of the center um, uh, here at Anderson is to uh, facilitate everything and anything that has to do with global issues uh, in, uh, at Anderson. Uh, it, we don't have exclusivity on that uh, particular area. Uh, there are other centers, other initiatives. Professor Bhagwan Chowdhury has his fantastic initiative uh, in India. Uh, but we are sort of an umbrella organization, and Lucy Allard is our uh, force and, 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 and the power behind everything that, that we do, and we are very grateful uh, for that. Uh, the final point is that um, I was uh, telling the, the group of speakers uh, that we were hosting at lunch that every year we are marveled by the quality of the conference. And uh, we think that it will be impossible to improve. And every year we are surprised to find out that the students have put together an even better conference than the previous year. Those of you uh, who were here last year may remember that we had uh, president, former President Alvaro Uribe from um, Colombia, and I interviewed him. And uh, the students uh, this year tried very hard to get another former president, um, and it was not possible. The, the ones we wanted to invite or we invited were very busy. Some um, are actually not in free circulation. They are having legal problems. And some we really didn't want to invite. <laughs> so we don't have a former president this year, but what I was telling the group at lunch is that we very, it's not unlikely that among the organizers of this conference, we have future heads of, ta of states for Latin America. And that is something, of course, that uh, is very nice and it gives us a lot of uh, hope in, uh, in the future of the region. So again, thank you so much. And uh, let's uh, get uh, going with the conference. And now uh, the first speaker is Sebastian Edwards. That's me. I have, a, I have a small presentation, and uh, it uh, basically uh, deals with the region's uh, challenges and opportunities. And uh, I'm going to talk uh, 
about a number, a number of topics. Uh, and it's going to be long on uh, challenges uh, and not so long on opportunities, mostly because during the conference itself, you will see the opportunities discussed by the different, uh, by the different speakers. So the first point that I want to make, um, most of you are familiar with Latin America, but there are some people in the audience that come here to uh, visit us and, and are a little bit intrigued by the region or, or, or don't have a big picture. The first issue is that size matters, as most of us know. And um, our countries are pretty large in terms of economic size. And what I have here is the 46 largest countries in the world measured by the size of their internal market, which in turn I measure by uh, their GDP. Okay? And I have 46 of them. And um, can you guess why 46 instead of, uh, say, 40 or 45? 45 would have been a rounder number. But the reason I have 46 is because uh, Walter Bailey from Peru is here, and I wanted to include Peru in the list. <laughs> uh, so I said, um, I, I, of course, I did not want to use 40, because then this little country here would have been excluded, and that's not acceptable. And then I said, well, I used 45. And then I realized, uh-uh, Walter is going to be left out. So 46 countries. So we have large countries. There is one Latin American country in the top 10. There is two in the top dozen largest countries. And uh, then we have uh, the third largest country is Argentina uh, at number 27. Um, um, the European Union is not a country, but it's here in terms of the size of the economy. We are large. And that is an opportunity. But we ain't rich. And that is a challenge. The challenge is to become rich. So. I have here now by income per capita, which tells you how rich we are. It's not the total size of the economy, but the income per person. And if I had used the 46 highest countries, there would have been zero Latin American countries. And that's not good. We cannot have a Latin American conference without any Latin American countries. So I was forced to move all the way to 65. And if you ask me why 65 instead of 60, well, because we have our guests from Mexico, and Mexico is a very important country, so we want to include Mexico among these countries. So we have our Latin countries are all sort of in this part of this part. The, the, the highest income is uh, Chile, uh, which is being challenged as the leader in the region by Panama and uh, Uruguay. Really, the differences between uh, Chile, Panama, and Uruguay are real, it's uh, minuscule. So it may be very well within the rounding error of the way these things are measured. Um, and then uh, we have uh, Argentina and uh, Mexico. Okay. All of these uh, data are measured in what uh, economists call purchasing power parity, which is something that students learn in our classes. And what purchasing power parity does is that it allows us to do comparisons across countries. Because we want to say that if two countries produce identical number of things, they are equally well off. However, since we cannot add within each country apples and pears, shirts and TV sets, what we add is the value of production. The value is the, what, what people in management call the P times Q. Q is the quantity, P is the price. But if we have two identical countries with the same number of things, everything, everything that is produced is the same quantity, but in one of the two countries, say country B, prices are lower than in country A, it will appear that country A is better off than country B. Why? Because all the P's are higher in A, and since we are adding the P times Q, but in reality, they are identical. So, what we do here is we use this technique called PPP. This is turning like in a class, right, into a lecture. PPP, what we do is we use common prices to price everything that is produced in every country. So when I teach this in my class, I find among the students someone from India, uh, 
a gentleman, and I ask him, have you been home recently? And they say, yes. And I say, when? They say, three months ago. I went on vacation. And I say, did you have a haircut at home? And they say, yes. How much did you pay? And they say, $2 in US money. And how much did you pay when you have a haircut here in the US? $20. We're talking barber, not stylist haircuts here, right? <laughs> Plain vanilla. And so $2 in India, or $20 here. But if India produces the same number of haircuts as here, the contribution of haircuts to GDP should be the same, so we have to value them at the same price. When you do that, you get these numbers, and still we ha yeah, have that our countries are not rich. We are large, we have the size, but we are not rich. And the challenge then is to become rich. One of the challenges is to become rich. And becoming rich means that we have to grow during the next few years at a faster rate than these guys over here, so that when this table is put together 10 years from now, our countries have at least migrated to the middle column. That is one of our challenges and one of the challenges that I am going to be focusing on. And one way to think about the path to prosperity through economic growth is to go back to this very, very famous article which was published uh, about 15 years ago by Goldman Sachs when they invented the acronym BRICS. And BRICS stands, as you probably know, for Brazil, Russia, India, and China. And these are, or were, according to Goldman, the countries of the future. And in this paper, they de developed a methodology to project how much these countries were going to grow between the year this was published and the year 2050. And what caught everyone's attention was that they argued that most of the BRICS were going to surpass the G6 countries, the G6 being the US, Japan, the UK, Germany, France, and Italy before the year 2050. Now, the BRICS, why did they pick these countries besides the fact that it's a fascinating acronym which became famous instantaneously? And the reason it brings us back to the first point I made, size, matters. These are all very large countries. So one of the questions that we have to ask ourselves, and I put this, I, I want you to put this in the back burner of your minds and start thinking, is when we think about countries of the future, do we keep thinking always of large countries? And whether small countries have any future? So we saw that the number one country in terms of income per capita in Latin America was Chile, which is a mid-sized mid country. 18 million people. But it's followed by Panama and Uruguay, which are really small countries. Right? Very good at lots of things they do. Uruguay, great um, soccer uh, teams. One of the players is very, has a very sort of firm bite. <laughs> and um, Panama, great baseball players. So, but they are small countries. Now, when, when people have expanded the notion of what other group of countries beside the BRICS have a future, people talk about the mints. And the mints stand for Mexico, Indonesia, Nigeria, Turkey, and South Africa. Again, large countries. So size matters. And remember, we have size. We have four countries in the top, I don't know, 25, and then eight countries in the top 46 in terms of size. So what did Goldman Sachs say in terms of growth? So remember, we are large, but not so rich. We want to become richer. That means we need to grow faster. And how do we grow faster? Well, we can look at many theories, but the one that is easy and people respect and are impressed by is the Goldman Sachs theory, the Goldman Sachs model developed in this paper, the BRICS paper. And what they say is they use some equations. You know, my students hate equations until I show them equations with the Goldman Sachs logo here. And then they demand learning about the equations. Okay, if Goldman Sachs logo is here, it must mean that these equations are important, right? So there are some equations which I'm just having them here so that you know that they're here. And then here is what Goldman Sachs says about the conditions for growth. And the conditions for growth are very simple. My grandmother understood them when I told her about the Goldman Sachs model. If you want to produce more, you want to grow, you want to expand the size of your market by having more production and more income, 
you need more machines, you need more workers, and you need to combine capital and labor, machines and workers, in a more efficient way. And those are the three sources of growth that Goldman Sachs identifies and looks at and projects into the future when it says the BRICS countries are going to surpass, in terms of economic size, the G6 within two generations. So more capital, and in economics we call more capital, and in, in, in finance, investment. That means that we have to increase the number of machines, improve our infrastructure, um, uh, our warehouses, and so on and so forth. But in order to invest more, we need a very robust financial sector that we will intermediate the savings that people put in the financial sector. People that have a little extra money put money into banks and in the financial sector, and the financial sector then has to lend that money to entrepreneurs and companies that have projects. And we're gonna be talking in this conference a lot about that and about the new technologies, the new perspective, the new vision of microfinance, of uh, digital finance, of internet banking, and so on and so forth. So we need more machines. In order to have more machines, we need more investment. In order to have more investment, we need more savings. And I will show you that we're not doing too good in those areas. We also need more workers. And here is a paradox of sorts that we study in our courses here at Anderson. On the one hand, in the short run, we worry about unemployment. So we say, well, will people find work? Will find jobs? Will they keep their jobs? And if you look at the Latin countries, many countries are now seeing an increase in unemployment, and that is a concern. On the other hand, we are also worried about labor shortages. In some countries, there are not going to be enough workers. So the challenge is to balance these two things. But more than expanding the number of bodies in the economy, we want the workforce to be quality workforce. And that means more and better education. And the challenge then is to improve the education system in the uh, Latin American countries. And we here at Anderson know a lot about education. And of course, the third challenge is to combine machines and workers in an ever-growing, efficient, more efficient way. And that is known as product productivity improvement. So let me talk a little bit about each of uh, these uh, issues. Let me go back now once again to growth. We have not done well. Uh, we are growing. This is from McKinsey, 20, 2000, 2000 to 2015. And if you use, this is a recent paper published uh, in a, a few months ago by McKinsey. If you add this all the way to 2017, the data are more or less the same. We've grown at 2.9%, which is the lowest rate on average of all of the emerging world. And that ain't good. This is the average for the emerging world. And uh, we have done um, barely as well as Australia and uh, New Zealand. We need, as, and that's the challenge I'm talking about, expand this and make it go at least to the average of emerging countries, 2.5%. That's almost 5.5%, sorry. That's almost doubling. That's not easy. We need to improve, to double our effort. Let me now talk about some, one of the challenges that I mentioned, which is we need not only more workers, but better workers. So these are the outcomes of the PISA test um, that is administered by the OECD every three years. Okay? And what they do is that on a given day, about, uh, I don't know, 40,000 or 50,000 13-year-olds from all over the world take the same test. And one is uh, uh, on math, one on science, and the questions are identical. Okay, for 13-year-olds, and one is on reading comprehension, where, of course, the, 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 the text that you have to read is different because different people have different languages. And here we have the average for the OECD in purple, and the U.S. is in red. And if you think that the mean and the median are the same, which they are not, as I'm going to show you, uh, we see that there are no Latin countries in the top 50% of the PISA. 
we are not doing well, okay? So the usual suspects do the best, Singapore, Hong Kong, Macau, Taiwan, Japan, China, Korea, okay? So these guys are studying nonstop, okay? And while, while they are studying and making progress, we are not even in the scorecard, okay? That's, that's concerning. And they are growing at 8.5%, and we're growing at 2.9%. So something is wrong, okay? So here I have now all the countries that took the PISA, which is a smaller sample than the, there are, there are 200 countries in the world. This is about 80 countries. And this big red arrow, that's the median, which is below the average. So this divides the sample into two equal size, okay? And I have the US repeated here and here so that you know that I have not doctored the picture. Okay, I didn't leave the, the, the middle out. I, it's the complete thing, except I had to split it because otherwise the numbers, the letters are too small. And we can see that the number one country in Latin America is not a country, it's the Ciudad Autónoma de Buenos Aires. So Argentina decided that if they present the whole country in a, the test, they rank around here. So they say, we're going to only have Buenos Aires, which is going to do better. Okay, so Buenos Aires is here, but we know better because Argentina was taking the test as a nation earlier, and they are around here. Okay, so Hispanic Americans in the U.S. are here. Okay, so that, that, that's, that's pretty, that's not excellent, but it's not bad. I mean, to be like, uh, like uh, porteños, like people from Buenos Aires, that's okay, I guess. And then if you took, take countries, Chile, again, number one, and then we have Uruguay, then we have Costa Rica and, and Mexico, then we have Colombia, Brazil and Peru. And look at the DR, the Dominican Republic. And if we were to take the rest of Central America, it would be around like the Dominican Republic. Okay, so we are not doing well. It's a very serious challenge is to improve the quality of education. And the problem with this is that, and I'm not, I'm not gonna give you the solutions, I'm gonna just list the challenges here. The problem with this, of course, is that every year when there are elections, every candidate says that they are going to do that and nothing really happens. We're gonna have elections in the next weeks in Colombia and in Mexico, two of the large countries in our list. We just had uh, elections in Chile, the new president is taking office in nine days, and they all talk about education, and very little happens. Productivity, we said that's another source of growth according to Goldman Sachs. And here we see all regions in the world and the bottom, the, 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 the top part of these bars, the ones in bluish color, is contribution of productivity improvement to that region's growth. Okay. So Asia grew at 9% almost. And most of its growth, almost 90% of 9%, is due to increases in productivity, improvement. They became more efficient. We grew at 3%, and only 22% of our meager 3% was due to productivity. That ain't good. We have to improve. And many of the panels in this conference are going to talk about that. The World Bank calculates an index called doing business, which tells you the ease of doing, how easy and how uh, welcoming countries are to the business community. And uh, here we have our Latin countries and uh, the OECD, which is a club of rich countries, plus Turkey, Mexico, and Chile. Some years ago I said rich countries, plus Korea, Mexico, Chile, and Turkey. But Korea now is rich, so Korea is part of the main group of the OECD. And we can see that our gap in terms of how business friendly our countries are relative to the OECD is growing. The OECD, which includes countries that are very heavy on regulation, Sweden, Finland, Iceland, all the Scandinavian countries, they are more friendly than we are, but on, only that, the gap is growing. And this is in the different categories of doing business, 
out of, on average, the Latin American countries, out of 200 countries where we uh, score in two years, in the year 2010 and 2017. And you can see that we are scoring lower. So out of 200, in ease to start a business, we were on average in the 80th category. Now we are 91. So all the gray bars are higher than the greenish bars. That means we're going backward. Big challenge. Investment in infrastructure, we should all be investing around 9% in infrastructure. The highest is Nicaragua. Okay, they have a, a, a lot of reconstruction and so on, catching up to do after the Sandinistas and the different hurricanes and, and earthquakes, but they are like 50% below what they should be doing. Okay, so I told you I was going to be very frank, speak with the truth, and tell you what the challenges are. We have the right size, but we need to work on catching up, and those are the challenges. Let me tell you a, a, bit, a little bit about other challenges for all the countries, old age, crisis, and pensions. We are getting old. This is in 2000, the demographic pyramid in Latin America. People below 10 years old were this, th this many people, and the viejitos, they were a very small number. 2050, most people in this audience, not me, but most of you are gonna be alive by 2050. I don't know about Bagwan, maybe yes, maybe no. He's borderline, huh? Do you expect to be alive in 2050? I hope not. I, yeah. <laughs> he hopes not, right? Walter for sure is gonna be here. But 2050 is not a pyramid any longer. It has the shape of a T. The viejitos are very, look at this. And more viejitas, so this is, each viejito has going to have ma many viejitas, but, okay? But how are we going to support the old people? And now, this is not a Latin, exclusively a Latin problem. It's all over the world, but it's a big, big challenge that we have to think forward. And the financial sector plays a very important role. And Walter, um, uh, uh, who uh, runs the largest bank in Peru, and has interest and understands the pension system in Peru can talk to us a lot about that. Automation and jobs. According to McKinsey, this percentage of jobs in our countries could be replaced today by robots with today's technology. This is not 50 years from now. With today's technology, Peru could replace 53.2% of all jobs by robots. Okay, so Peru has, the, the retail sector in Peru has grown a lot, lots of investment from Chile. We know now that Amazon has a store in, um, in Seattle where you don't need cash, you don't need anything. Just robots do all the work. You can walk in and walk out with the stuff and your credit card uh, is debited. And we're not doing anything about that. Protectionism and Trump. We're gonna have a whole panel on NAFTA. NAFTA seventh round is about to start. And uh, the market, I don't know how it did today, but yesterday it tanked. Why? Because President Trump is going to slap tariffs on steel and aluminum, and protectionism is coming back to the US. And people are not that worried in the world about the US uh, shooting itself on the foot by imposing import tariffs on steel. The problem is that we may have a trade war, and wars of any kind are always bad. Macro instability and currencies. Look at poor Mexico. Huh? Tan lejos de Dios y tan cerca de los Estados Unidos. <laughs> okay, so the peso was very stable at 13, and then it went to 22. Wow, that's a Trump effect on the Mexico. Then it strengthened, so it went down to 17 something, and now it's around 19. But this is a big problem. We have people here from um, Grupo Alpha, Mexico exchange is a big problem. And the Bank of Mexico, which now has a new governor, Agustin Carstens, who was the most robust central banker in Latin America. He is gone, and, but look at the Bank of Mexico. It has had to raise rates from 3% to almost 8% to fight the depreciation of the peso. And if the interest rate keeps going up, people are going to stop 
uh, spending, firms are going to stop investing, mucho problema, okay? Peso tumbles because of Trump, but it's not only in Mexico. These are three normal countries, includes Peru, normal, Colombia, sort of normal, and Chile, very normal, excludes Brazil and Argentina, best soccer in the world, <laughs> but not very normal, the economy. But you can see that also depreciation, but now they have sort of settled down, okay? And I have some other stuff here I'm going to skip. All of this is about the peso, the Mexican peso, which is a problem, and we can talk about it uh, later. But basically, with Trump and political instability in Mexico, we don't know who's gonna be the next president. With a political system where the new president may be elected with 31% of the vote, because there are going to be many candidates and you don't need, there's no second round with a plurality of 31% of the vote, what's going to be the mandate? How is the politics going to develop in Mexico? Problemas for Mexico and Mexican peso. I wanna finish with a point which I think is very important. We are all, one way or another, connected and related to the business world. Right? Some of you are management students, many of you are business people, many of you run companies. Um, some of us teach uh, business, some of us serve on boards, on corporate boards. The one thing that is always fundamental is that you have to have a benchmark for comparison. And uh, if the benchmark has to be a proper benchmark, it cannot be a totally unreachable goal because then it dilutes and people and workers and the workforce does not pay attention to it. And it cannot be an easy goal. And we in Latin America need to set our goals, our vision into something, into perspectives that in my view are quantifiable and verifiable and realistic. And let me tell you the story of the country where I was born, which is uh, Chile, which it, it's now the number one country. It used to be like the number nine or 10. Right? And it went through good practices, market orientation, openness, competition, good managers, lots of MBAs from Anderson. It went to number one. But throughout our lives in Chile, we have measured ourselves relative to Argentina. And now that we surpassed Argentina, everyone is happy. Oh, we are better than the Argentines. We even beat them twice at the Copa America. <laughs> now, we are out of the World Cup, but we don't think that that makes a lot of sense. Right? But that is not the right benchmark. We need to use the right benchmark. So there are people in Chile who say, oh, we need to look at Finland. It's absurd. Fin people, Finnish people are 6'5", they are blonde, have blue eyes. They live up there. They speak Finnish, which is very complicated. They have the, the Russia as a neighbor. It doesn't make sense. So I, I have been pushing, and I think that we should think about this. Chile should compare itself on most of Latin America with, with Australasia. Mexico with Australia, and Chile, and Peru, and the mid-sized country with New Zealand. And uh, let me finish with this. So, in Chile, we have a lot of, as all of our countries, indigenous people, and we need to bring them in. We need to, to be more inclusive, to have better policies towards indigenous people. In Chile, our most important group of indigenous people are called Mapuches. Well, New Zealand also has Mapuches. The Finns don't have Mapuches, except that the Mapuches in New Zealand are called Maoris, but they are Mapuches, and they have brought them in. There's the same problem. Our countries are blessed by natural resources. So is New Zealand and Australia. Our countries are really far away. The distance between Buenos Aires and Frankfurt is as large, as big as between Sydney and Tokyo. So we need to improve our benchmarking. And here, the, this got out of, but if we, if we take the income back gap between Chile and New Zealand is 39%. Right? We're 39% below, behind New Zealand. But we used to be 75% behind New Zealand. So Chile was able to catch up from 25% income to the, relative to New Zealand to almost two thirds. It can be done. If Chile grows 
during the next generation, which is 25 years, which is most of you are going to be as old as Bagwan, maybe, when in 25 more years, or as young as, as Bagwan, Professor uh, Chowdhury. In 25 years, if Chile grows every year on average 1.5 points more than New Zealand, we're going to totally close the gap with New Zealand. Where, with where New Zealand is going to be then, not now. And let me finish by telling you what that challenge really uh, uh, means, and then I will stop. In doing business, New Zealand won, Chile 57. Gini coefficient with measures inequality, much more equal income distribution in New Zealand. PISA test, which I told you is the quality of education, Chile 44, New Zealand 12. Corruption, New Zealand the least corrupt country in the world, Chile 24. Yale Environmental Protection Index, New Zealand 11, Chile 52. Human Development Index from the UNDP, New Zealand number seven. This captures all sorts of social statistics, Chile 38. Chile is number one in Latin America in almost everything. So if I showed you Colombia or Peru, it would be much lower. That's why I'm picking Chile here. How many universities are in the top 400 according to the Times of London? New Zealand, a country with less than five million people has four. Chile has zero. And freedom and social uh, and, and liberties and, and civil uh, liberties according to Freedom House, New Zealand seven, Chile 18. It's a beautiful challenge, it's doable. If we work hard, if you work hard, if we really focus, we can do it. Our people deserve that we make the effort. Our challenges are big, but we are, will be able to get over all the impediments if we work really hard. And the kind of conference, gathering, discussion, networking that is going on in these Latin American business conferences every year here at Anderson help towards that goal. Let's continue working hard because, my friends, si se puede. Thank you so much. Thank you.